Mar Benjamin Shimon, the Catholicist Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, was 31 years of age at the time of his assassination. He had succeeded his predecessor at the age of 18, and for 15 years had occupied the patriarchal see at Cochanis. His mother's name was Asyat, and the, the daughter of Kambar of Eil, an Assyrian Malik and also a deacon in the Eastern Church. His father's name was Ishai, a blood member of the patriarchal family. He received his early education under a prominent scholar from Toma by the name of David, who was first a deacon in the Eastern Church and was later elevated to the office of a bishop and named Bishop Abdin. In addition to his great scholarship, Bishop Ephraim was also known for his piety and devotion, the future patriarch of the East, therefore could have been spiritually and educationally revered by no better instructor. He also took advantage of the Archbishop of Canterbury's mission representatives in Cochenus and gained not a little knowledge from those learned missionaries, his great office, besides his requirements in theological and ecclesiastical training made it incumbent upon himself to make himself familiar with political science and the world's diplomacy. He was fortunate in this realm of study. By having able English tutors who were deeply interested in the natural aspirations of his people, as well as in the spiritual welfare of his church. It has been conceded that, with the exception of Marjum II, known by the distinguishing name of Barsabe, and whose incumbency and martyrdom took place during the reign of Shuper the Mege, in the 4th century, a greater man than Mar Yamin has not occupied the patriarchal see of that Eastern Church. He possessed the most wonderful personality which inspired both fear and love at the same time. It was his great magnetism which impelled both reverence and allegiance from all sectarian elements of his people who had for more than a generation left their former fold and affiliated themselves with other religious beliefs. His personality became thus a center around which all the Assyrians rallied and presented a united front both in emergencies of war and in the pursuit of national aspirations. Had he been spared the bullet of the assassin and the promises made to the Assyrians by their allies been fulfilled, Mar bin Yaman, by the common consent of the people, would have been proclaimed either as a king or as the first president of the Assyrian nation. All truly great men are humble and meek. Such was the young patriarch of the East. The Russian generals gave him the homage of a king and the little children would run to him as to a lowing father. He elicited the admiration of the Grand Duke of Russia, who in conversing with his visitor felt as if he was in the presence of a crowned king, and he made himself the idol of his people by the attention he paid to the poorest and the humblest of his flock. He rode in the imperial carriage and received the welcome given to a czar. When he visited Tiflis and he, at the sight of the weary refugees of his people, whom he founded limping on the roads, took their place by walking afoot and gave them the horse he had mounted. He was considered the most handsome man in the Assyrian nation. And yet, back of those charming futures delay the beauty of his character. The constant smile of his face radiated the sunshine of his soul. As a sincere Christian, he commanded with authority, and yet his rebukes were fatherly mingled with kindness and mercy. Undoubtedly, it was the sweet charm of his character that endeared him to all classes and all religious colors of the Assyrian nation. The Roman Catholics and the Protestants revered and loved him for his noble and love-inspiring traits and were forced to acknowledge him as their leader. He possessed the most liberal mind. With the authority of a patriarch, he could have preserved the ecclesiastical fence, which for centuries had protected his church against intrusion and proselyting efforts. But with his democratic tendencies and broad-mindedness, he removed the fences and gave freedom of thought and belief to his flock. One intense desire of his heart was that his people should be educated and enlightened, and with the most generous heart he removed all obstacles in the path of the various missionary bodies. The early custom of the Eastern Church was to select for the office of bishop worthy men from monasteries and theological schools. But with the conquest of Islam, which destroyed both the monasteries and schools, and with the retreat of the Assyrians into the fastness of the mountains for self-preservation, the ancient custom inevitably ceased. And in order to maintain the religious system and carry on the church work, the existing bishops selected their successors from among their kin and dedicated them from the sacred office from their infancy. Mar Binyamin, however, installed a new system by which the most worthy and capable men were selected for the office of a bishop, irrespective of their degrees or family affiliations. During his incumbency as a patriarch, he had prevented one of his own nephews from being dedicated to become his successors, making, him, making known his desire that even the patriarchs of the Eastern Church should thereafter be made the choice of the flock and be selected by the church. 
Notwithstanding his youthful age, he towered over all the leaders of his people in wisdom and statesmanship. Ever consciousness, however, of his people and better judgment, he never failed to consult with his inferiors. He was open to convic conviction and ready to receive conceal and advice from others. He was barren of pride and living example of unselfishness. By his conduct, he taught service and sacrifice. He thought immeasurably more of the relief and the uplift of his people than all of the honors that were heaped upon him. Human nature is susceptible to the perils of applause. But Marban Yamin always emerged like the Hebrew exiles from such pits and furnaces, untouched by lions and unscathed by fire. His love of humanity gave him the tenderest heart towards his enemies. His constant advice to his officers and men was to acquit themselves like Christians and not return evil for evil. In the fearful whirlpool of the Great War, he never forgot to demonstrate the reality of the Christian religion, as well as its superiority over all other religions. The great love of his heart made him believe all men. And it was this credulity that led him to his assassination and death. Thus, the great patriarch, like his great predecessor, laid down his life upon the altar of his Christian faith. And for the salvation of his afflicted people. Marshum un Barsabai, as the first Marshamun of the Eastern Church, received his crown of martyrdom at the hands of the Persian Magi. Who had sworn to eradicate the name of Christianity from the face of their empire on the last Friday in the month of March, in the year 340 and in the southern province of Persia. While Marshaman bin Yaman, as the 16th incumbent of the same seat and with the same name, drank the same cup, which was now prepared by the Muslims of Persia, who had likewise sworn to exterminate the followers of the same faith in Persia on the first Saturday in March in the year 1918 and in the northern province of Persia. And yet how incomprehensible, even though infallible, the wondrous ways of God. An ungodly nation still remains like an unbroken rib in the giant body of the wild beast of Islam why a Christian nation of numberless martyrs barely retains its national existence. There is but one solution, and only one. It is not the present possessions that count, but rather the everlasting armies of the redeemed gathered and prepared for the glorious and certainly not distant day, when the rightful owner of the earth shall descend with his saints to challenge the authority of Satan, find the great enemy of God and mankind, and transform a paradise lost into a paradise regained. Within two months after the death of Mar ben Yamin, his brother, Marpolis, was chosen by the church and ordained to succeed the lamented patriarch. The elevation of Marpol Shimon to the patriarchal seat took place in the presence of a vast audience in the church of Matmariam, in the city of Urmia, as a Babylon of Islam witnessed, for the first time in its history, the ordination of a successor to the man it had treacherously betrayed and slain. It was the custom of the patriarch to keep moving among his people, the impending troubles of Ormia had prolonged the usual period of his stay there. The enemy, having been punished and forced to sign the peace agreement on the Assyrian terms, Mar Shimon made preparation to depart for Salmas and been in the midst of another part of the exiled flock. The news of his intended departure had, of course, preceded him by several days and had reached the ears of Tabriz authorities, and Salmas at this time resided in a Turia's brigand by the name of Simco. He was undoubtedly the most dreaded by the Persian authorities of all the Kurdish chieftains of the Eastern Kurdistan. And was regarded as the strongest of them all. Through the game of diplomacy, he had managed to be alternately now on the Persian side and then again on the Turkish side. At the time of the Russian occupation of the state of Azerbaijan, the notorious brigand had surprised his co-religionist and fought on the side of the Allies as well. He was once captured by the Russian soldiers and taken to Tiflis as a prisoner. But before the collapse of Russia, he had succeeded in gaining the favor of the Russian military authorities to secure his freedom and to bring back with him a considerable supply of arms and ammunition on the promise that he would use his available force against the Turks. After the Russians had completely withdrawn from Persia, Simko, so far as Persia was concerned, became supreme. And since the days of Shah Abbas, no monarch has exercised as great an authority over the boundary lands of northwestern Persia. The Persian government of which he was a subject, he had defied as he could always defy. And so far as the Turks were concerned, he knew he could play the game again by telling them that he was forced into the service of Russia against his will. Simcoe had one fear only, and that had always been risen from the Assyrian marksman of Targovar, even though 
they were inferior to his men in numbers. But now the Assyrian warriors of the hills were, or, were already present in Persia. He had become peaceful with them and had apparently decided to give up his lawlessness and move to the mountains of Bardust and Somaik. It was this man that the Persian authorities used as a tool in their hands for the assassination of Marshamun. And after he had committed the dastardly deed, he was told if the Turks failed to make their appearance in Persia by that time, he could escape into the interior of the country and remain there unmolested. Marshamun and his bodyguards of 200 horsemen arrived in Salmas during the last week of February 1918. He was welcomed by his own people and by the Armenians as well. Even the Muslims of Salmas vied with the Christians in the bestowal of honors upon him. Shortly after his arrival, he was visited by two emissaries of the Persian authorities of Tabriz. They reminded him of the letter that he had sent several months before to the Tabriz authorities, expressing his goodwill to the Persian government and requesting of the latter that he and his people would be allowed to reside in the Persian government as temporary guests. They officially informed the Patriarch of the deep appreciation that was felt by the Persian authorities of the contents of his Beatitudes letter, and that how those authorities have been glad to serve a humanitarian cause by gladly opening the gates of their country to give the Assyrian Christians a place of refuge. But the emissaries added, inasmuch as the Persian authorities desired to see those boundary lands in perfect peace and tranquility, and inasmuch as they would no longer countenance any local Muslim agitations and uprising against the Christians, they thought that it would be for the interest of peace. If the only source of trouble that might disturb the tranquility of the country was eliminated. In that inasmuch as the Kurdish chieftain had indicated to the Persian authorities a strong desire to come to an understanding with the Assyrians, it would absolutely ensure the desired end if his beatitude could likewise assure Simcoe and his followers of his friendly attitude towards the latter as well. It is a short distance between Delman, the capital of Salmas, where Marshuman's brothers and sisters resided, and Kona Shahar, where Simcoe had established his new headquarters. Before the former city attained the dignity of a capital, the latter had the honor of being both the center of business and the seat of government. And for that very reason, the old municipality still retains its name as ancient city. Kona Shahar had a large Armenian population. The latter had been wise to the setting of the trap for the assassination of Marshamon. They had now a common interest with the Assyrians. They were to perish or survive with their co-religionists. They secretly apprised the Patriarch of Islam's plot and pleaded with him not to meet Simko unless the latter came to Delaman to meet him. From the viewpoint of political etiquette, it was indeed the place of Simko to have called on the Patriarch. But the latter, ever anxious to avoid bloodshed and maintain peace with his Muslim neighbors, and ever ready to exhibit the spirit of his Christian professions, with his characteristic humility declared his decision to visit Simcoe in his own headquarters. The warnings of the Armenians, the pleadings of his own people, and the tears of his nearest relatives could not persuade him to alter his decision. He was as fearless as he was meek and lowly. The Muslim element of Delman was of course aware of the plot, and with satanic interest they were watching the road over which either Simcoe was to seal the doom of conspiracy by coming to the commander-in-chief of the Assyrian forces, or the Christian patriarch, prompted by the high qualities of his Christian profession, was to be led like a lamb to the slaughter. And the Tabris authorities lost sight for a moment of the gigantic struggle that was going on between the mighty armies of Europe the result of which might mean to them either the supremacy or the downfall of the Islam in Asia. And intently fasten their eyes upon the sea. Where the awful tragedy of their own creation and planning was to be enacted. On, On the, the third, third day, day of March, March 1918, 1918, the patriarch sat in his carriage and with a bodyguard of 150 horses started for the headquarters of the Kurdish chieftain. He went to assure the notorious brigand that he could remain absolutely certain of the peaceful attitude of the Assyrians. Provided his own men indulged no longer in deeds of violence and lawlessness. But was not this noble and Christian attitude of a great patriarch equivalent to the giving of bread to the dogs and the casting of pearls before the swine? The news of Marshaman's departure preceded him. The great assassin who could hardly believe the report. Stationed 700 of his best marksmen and concealed in commanding positions. With the orders to shoot simultaneously at the sight of the patriarch. When he emerged from the house of their chieftain after the visit. No servant could have received his master with a greater honor 
the patriarch escorted into the house. Two of his bodyguard accompanied him within. The others remained outside. The apparent absence of the Kurds from the environs of the chieftains took the Assyrians off their guard. In the course of a friendly interview between the patriarch and the Kurdish chief, one of the men who had accompanied Marshalman into the house noticed from the window the presence of the concealed Kurds on the surrounding roofs. Realizing the full importance of the situation, the attendant said to the patriarch in Assyrian, My lord, our end is certain. Permit me to kill this man, Simcoe, just to avenge the blood that will surely be shed. The patriarch, with an incredulous smile, bade his attendant be calm. My lord, repeated the Assyrian guard, they will surely kill us all. Let me kill him. Perhaps we can save your life. The patriarch restrained his attendant again. He arose to depart, accompanied by Simcoe, to the door. The latter shook the hand of his guest and went back into the house. And just as Moshaman was seated in his carriage, surrounded by his bodyguard, the 700 Kurds fired, all simultaneously, into the group of their unsuspecting victims. Only six of these men escaped with wounds in their bodies to give the news of the tragedy and tell the story of the patriarch's assassination. In conclusion of this historical speech, his Holiness decreed that a commemoration of Mar Benyam and Shimon shall be observed yearly by the Assyrian Church of the East throughout the world, on the first Sunday that falls before the Sunday entering in or beginning of the Lent.